unanimously. So now we will go to uh, discussion agenda item number two, which is a consideration of ballot measure proposal by Women Occupy San Diego regarding the establishment of an independent commission on police practices. Um, as Ms. St. Julian uh, comes up, we're going to have introductory comments by our city attorney's representative here. Thank you, council member, uh, committee chair Montgomery. I wanted to give an overview of the ballot measure process. On the committee's uh, discussion agenda day are two proposal ballot measures relating to civilian review of police practices. Item number two on the agenda is a proposed measure by Women Occupy that would change the city charter to establish an independent commission on police practices. This item was forwarded to Public Safety and Livable Neighborhoods Committee from Rules Committee to pro provide further policy direction and consideration for the November 2020 ballot. Item number three on the agenda is a proposed measure by the city attorney that would change the city charter to provide for an independent council for a community review board on police practices. This item was forwarded to the Public Safety and Livable Neighborhoods Committee from Rules Committee for policy discussion and direction consistent with Council Policy 00-21. This committee may approve, reject, or modify the ballot measures before it. A majority affirmative vote is required to move the item forward with a recommendation. If the committee wants to move one or both measures forward, as with all proposals under the Council Policy process, the proposed ballot language will be revised during the review process and is subject to legal review and analysis. Any motion that advances should direct the city attorney to work with designated city staff to complete legal review and prepare a draft ballot measure. Note that revisions to the measure may occur during legal review. Once legal review is completed and the ballot measure has been drafted, the measure would return to this committee or to rules for a second discussion. If the measure advances after the second review, the committee would forward the measure to council for consideration. I'll close this brief overview of the process with a reminder of the city's requirement to meet and confer. As we advised the council previously, this measure cannot be placed on the ballot by the council until and unless a meet and confer process required by state labor laws is satisfied. This process requires reasonable notice to the impacted employee organizations and an opportunity to identify and bargain the impacts of the measures. This process may result in changes to the ballot measure for final consideration by city council. If agreement is not reached, mediation, fact-finding, and impasse process may occur or be required. With that, I return it back over to the committee chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And now we'll turn it over to Ms. Andrea St. Julian uh, for the presentation. How much time do you need? Would a half hour be too much? Uh, uh, let's let's do 20 minutes. Let's, let's do 20 let's minutes. Let's do there and then um, try to compact it in there. We have quite a bit of speakers and sure. uh, four, three more items after this one. So I, I totally understand. Thank I, you. And, and thank you. And uh, thank you, council members. Uh, my name is Andrea St. Julian. I am president of the Earl B. Gilliam Bar Association, and we've been working closely with Women Occupy San Diego on this charter amendment. So what we first wanted to do is start out with the premise that we've been talking about throughout this process, which is the, the, the main purpose of the commission is to create trust between the community and the San Diego Police Department and create trust in the community-led review of complaints. But one thing we haven't really talked about too much is why there's this disconnect and why there's this feeling of distrust among the community. And so we wanted to first just briefly go over some of the things that have happened in the recent past that have caused the community to uh, lack trust in the, the police department and also the review of complaints. So I want to remind the council that in March of 2015, the federal government issued a report after reviewing 17 complaints of the San Diego Police Department. The, the, the federal review revealed that the police department, um, that there were gaps in their policies and practices, and there was a lack of consistent supervision and a failure to hold personnel accountable. And that is what had led to these allegations of misconduct. 
important for us, the, the uh, uh, investigation also revealed that there was inconsistent handling of citizen complaints and there was poor tracking of how the complaints were resolved. And of course, there were other things uh, that were part of this review, shocking allegations of sexual misconduct, allegations of cover-up, and also that there was insufficient transparency within the San Diego Police Department. So that was back in 2015, but unfortunately things have happened since 2015 that continue to give the communities pause. One of them is that one of the key supervisors who was implicated in the 2015 review, instead of being rebuked, rebuked was actually um, elevated, he was promoted. And again, that leads the community to feel a sense of, of uh, a lack of confidence. Uh, there were other things. Uh, there was the Wikipedia issue where there were individuals using police computers who were going in and, and deleting the misconduct uh, from Wikipedia pages. That, again, gives a sense of a, a continuing um, efforts to minimize misconduct events. And again, uh, even after the, the scandal of, mis of sexual misconduct, the police department failed to even tra to track sexual misconduct complaints, simply saying, well, we're not required to do it by the California Department of Justice. And then, of course, we have the 2018 Rewards for Arrests program, where low-income individuals were targeted for arrest and officers were, were going to be rewarded for those actions. And fortunately, that program didn't actually take place because there was a whistleblower within the police department. But again, it shows a lack of, of supervision about what was going on with that. And you know, I, I, there are other issues that have gone on since then. Um, I've listed some of them here. Uh, we can't forget the death of Fridun Nihad. We cannot forget just two months ago the horrible allegations of uh, sexual misconduct by an officer who allegedly solicited uh, a child for sex. Uh, and we'll never know what happened there because that police officer just last month killed himself. So that investigation isn't going to be completed. We can't forget Eddie Alvarez, who was beaten and jailed simply because he was exercising his right to film um, at a protest. And of course, there's Aaliyah Jenkins. And this is what she was before, a young mother, um, who unfortunately, once she was arrested, uh, um, even though she became unconscious, she was not given medical care. And she died 10 days later. And, you know, I, 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 do, I don't want to belabor this, but I want to make sure that the committee understands why this commission is so important and why trust needs to be regained. It's, it's, it's vitally important because of, of, of these actions. And so a second component of the lack of trust is simply the process of the current CRB. I want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, many people in Women Occupy work closely with the CRB. We respect every single member of the CRB. The CRB works very hard at what they do. And nothing that we say today is a criticism of those workers, of those, those uh, uh, board members. The, it, the problem is the limits of power that the current CRB has. The current CRB is a review model, meaning it just reviews the findings and conclusions of the police department. It cannot engage in independent investigation. Also, the current charter requires that the city attorney represent both the CRB and the police department. And the community sees that as a clear conflict of interest. Um, and the problem is this, uh, um, the detr this trust created by the CRB's lack of independence really negatively impacts the relationship between the police and the community. The police, uh, the community simply does not trust a process that is not fully independent. And so that's what this charter amendment is designed to fix. 
So what this charter amendment is, is essentially just a recognition that police officers are professionals, just like doctors and lawyers and dentists and psychologists. And those professionals have independent oversight as part and parcel of being a professional. So what this, this uh, charter amendment does is it really elevates the police department ad, as they should be to the level of professionals who should receive, uh, who should receive independent oversight just like all other professionals. And this commission really does nothing more than that. So the Charter Amendment meets the needs of the community because it fosters trust, transparency, and accountability. And all those three factors are key factors in an appropriate relationship between the community and the police department. So the CRB is an advisory board to the mayor, but this new commission is an independent entity. It is independent, and that's vital. The city charter requires the city attorney to represent the CRB, whereas in this new charter amendment, the commission is required to have independent legal counsel. The CRB has no authority to investiga investigate complaints, but the new commission has the authority to do that. CRB can't subpoena, the new commission does have subpoena power. The CRB is a very limited model. It's just a review model. The new commission is a hybrid model. It's investigatory, it's review, it's monitor, it's auditor. It really has the complete ability to meet all of the needs of the community. And again, that's why this commission is so important. The hybrid model is a good fit for San Diego, and that's really important. There are a lot, there's a lot of variety in, uh, in community-led oversight of police, a lot of variety throughout the country, but what's important is you really have to create something that is a fit for your own community, and we have done that. We made sure before we wrote this charter amendment, we met with individuals throughout the community. We have met with the POA. We've met with Chief Nislight. We've had ongoing meetings. I personally have given out, I've given out my personal email to people across the city saying, please call me and let me know what you want in this charter amendment. You know, we are wholly community-based and stakeholder-based. We want this to work for everyone. And that's why we took our time, really, for literally years receiving input. And when I, you know, I wrote the draft of the Charter Amendment, I made sure that we put everything in there and made it all work so that it would work for everyone. So um, one of the things I like to joke about is people will talk to me about the commission and, um, you know, my response will be, you know, I don't know what charter amendment you read, but it wasn't the one that I wrote. And that is because people have uh, really um, a lot of beliefs about what the charter amendment says that aren't actually in the charter amendment. So that's why I just want to take a few minutes just to kind of go through the important points and also to maybe dispel some myths about the charter amendment. So one of the biggest myths is that the commission is going to be required to investigate every single complaint. That is 100% untrue, right? When uh, part of the process of, of creating the Charter Amendment was I spoke with different boards and commissions throughout the country. And one thing that was consistently said to me was that please don't make the, this new commission investigate every single complaint. That, that wastes resources, it takes away time from the more important issues. And so what we did is this charter amendment only requires the, um, the commission to investigate all police shootings and deaths occurring as a result of police interaction. And um, with the remainder, there is some discretion, as I will talk about a little, uh, a little more later. So based on this requirement and on recent numbers, the, um, the commission is only going to be required to investigate about nine to 10 complaints a year, because that's about how many, that's the average of uh, police shootings and, and deaths, okay? So 
by requiring the commission to investigate only certain types of complaints, that makes sure that the commission has the resources to work most effectively. Um, now, but giving the commission the discretion, the discretion to in investigate certain co other complaints assures the community that complaints will be independently evaluated. So that meets everybody's needs. We meet the fiscal needs and the commission's needs to have uh, just, you know, have their, their resources um, directed toward the most important cases. Yet, on the other hand, the community can be assured that the commission can investigate other important cases. So that, again, works for everybody. Now, uh, since uh, Women Occupy submitted the charter, its proposed charter amendment, we've had continuing dialogue. Um, we've had a great dialogue with the Office of the Independent Budget Analyst. We've also spoken to uh, uh, even further the Police Officers Association, as well as other stakeholders. And based on the suggestions that many of those uh, um, entities and stakeholders made, um, we have made some, uh, we are going to be proposing today some changes to our charter amendment, our proposed charter amendment. And I have um, attached to the PDF version of what everyone has received, a full version of the changes, and the changes are in red. So it'll be easy for you to point them out. I will run through those changes uh, um, quickly uh, so that you can get a sense of where we're going. We do have a change in 41.23a. It is a change in language without much change in substance. So I won't go into that uh, 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 particularly uh, fully, but the change in language was really just necessitated by the change in language that's gonna be taking place later on in the charter amendment. So the first one uh, that I want to talk about in detail is 41.213A4. And uh, that provision, um, that those series of provisions talked about factors that the commission uh, has to look at in order determining whether to conduct a discretionary investigation. The last in those series of, of things was that the, that the commission could look at any incident the commission deems is appropriate. We had some discussion with, with, uh, with community members about that, and some people, some uh, entities had some concerns about that. So what we've done is we've stricken that provision. So, and instead, we really wanted to drill down, okay, so instead of having that kind of large open-ended provision, let's really drill down on what people are most concerned about. And I think everyone in this room will agree, what we're really concerned about are those, is that rare officer or, or, or that rare policy that people, that people are repeatedly complaining about, right? If you've got an officer that's getting a lot of complaints and you see a pattern of complaints, that's what you really, what you really want the com commission to investigate. So in striking that last one, we've added D, that an incident the commission determines may show a pattern of misconduct by the officer or officers involved. And that really gets to the heart of what we all want. And, the simmer, and similarly, the second one we've added is the commission determines uh, an incident the commission determines may show a pattern of inappropriate policies, procedures, or practices of the San Diego Police Department or its members. Again, that's what you really want to investigate. It's something that you're seeing repeatedly people complain about and something that shows a pattern. So that's what we, those are the changes we are requesting there today. Um, the next one is um, just following E in that same section. We have made a change, and that change is, um, was made as a result of the estimated budget that the in independent budget analyst came out with. So the independent budget analyst noted, um, noted that the San Diego Police Department has four categories of complaints. Uh, uh, category one, category two, informal and miscellaneous. 
So the um, IBA was a little concerned about the number of informal complaints and miscellaneous complaints that are concerned and suggested that the, the, um, the investigations of those complaints be limited. So we, you know, we, we thought about it, and in fact, we let the um, IBA know when they contacted us that no, we did not see those as being complaints that would be investigated. We did tell the IBA that. So when we got the IBA's suggestion back, we thought, okay, we need to make sure that we take all of the stakeholders into consideration. We need to think about you know, financially what's going on, and also the concerns that the community has for, for uh, trust. So what we did is we put in a provision that said the commission shall not investigate a complaint where the complainant has requested that the complaint be handed, handled without investigation unless the commission finds there is a compelling reason to do so. Also, the commission shall not investigate a complaint where no allegation or police officer is specified unless the commission finds that there is a compelling reason to do so. So why did we come up with this language? So what we've taken is the definition of informal and miscellaneous complaints, and we've said the commission is not going to investigate those complaints unless the commission finds there is a compelling reason to do so. So again, we made an effort to, to balance the, the, the desires of the stakeholders, all right? So, they are not going to investigate them unless there's a compelling reason to do so. And don't we all want that? You know, if there's an informal or miscellaneous complaint and the commission reviews that and thinks, ooh, you know, there's a really compelling reason here why we'd want to investigate that. Don't we want that investigated? You know, it is certainly going to be the very rare case. It will be the very rare case where there, where there will be a compelling reason. But we want to put that in there so that the community can trust the process. If we have a wholesale prohibition that you can never under any circumstance investigate what is essentially an informal or miscellaneous complaint, you're going to have community members who are not going to trust that process, all right? So that's why we have that language in there unless there's a compelling reason to do so. I also have to let, let uh, remind the, com the uh, committee that although the new commission will be receiving its own complaints, there will be some complaints that will be made to the police department. And the police department will be required to send those over to the new commission. The police department will be categorizing complaints as category one, two, informal, or miscellaneous. Part of the informal, an informal complaint is one where the, the individual has said, no, I don't want a full investigation. There are always gonna be people who are very suspicious that when the police department takes in a complaint, that they may have led an individual to say, I don't want a full investigation. And so if a complaint comes over, uh, 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 wow, 20 minutes is already up. So, <laughs> so with that, uh, what I would like to do is simply um, uh, uh, thank the committee, also let the committee members know that I think that the IBA did a fine job on the budget. Um, I, the, they have estimated a likely budget of $1.1 million, and uh, I think they did a very fair job on that. I would like to ask all of the community members who support this charter amendment to come up. Uh, I want, particularly want to thank Mid-City Can um, and, let Mid and uh, Mid City Can Youth Council and how important they have been in the process. One of the reasons why we strongly request that the, um, that the commission, uh, or that the committee allow um, uh, two youth, seat, uh, youth seats on this commission. Also wanna let, let people know that we have organizations from La Jolla, uh, Southeastern San Diego, Claremont Town Council, we have support throughout every part of this city. Everyone 
agrees on this uh, charter amendment. And for that reason, I hope that this committee will move this along and do so with the uh, uh, changes as we've requested. I'd like to thank each of you for letting us speak today. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. And before we turn to public comments, uh, we're going to give our independent budget analyst uh, a few minutes to speak. Thank you, Chair Montgomery. I'm Baku Patel with the Office of the IBA. At the Rules Committee meeting where this proposal was first reviewed, our office was requested by Council Member Kate to estimate the potential budgetary funding that a new commission on police practices may require under the Women Occupy San Diego proposal. We've since conducted that analysis and issued our report 19-20 on September 9th. Our office met with several stakeholders, examined the proposed ballot measure, and talked with other police oversight agencies in California in an attempt to determine the potential staffing and funding levels that may be necessary for the commission. Based on our analysis, we estimate that potential needs may reasonably range between seven FTEs and $1.1 million, up to 16 FTEs and $2.3 million. This range is primarily driven by the commission's potential investigative caseload. As was mentioned by Ms. St. Julian's, in Ms. St. Julian's presentation, the proposal requires investigations only on the limited types of cases. These are police shootings and officer-related deaths, which we estimate to be up to 15 cases per year based on historical information. In addition to this, the commission would have the discretion to investigate all complaints against the police department, which on average over the last 10 years, there have been 123 category one and two complaints received annually by the department's internal affairs. We note that this average does not include informal and miscellaneous complaints, which are generally those which either the complainant has chosen not to have an informal investigation conducted, or where the complaint does not contain a specific allegation, identify a specific PD member, or the complaint is generally questioning police procedure. It is our understanding that these other complaints were not intended to be included under the commission's purview, and we've therefore assumed that they're excluded in our analysis, and we have recommended that this modification be made to the proposal. Within our analysis, there are three variables that are likely to impact investigative staffing. The first relates to investigative scope, which differs substantially for different agencies we spoke with, thereby impacting caseload capacity per investigator. We note that investigative scope is not discussed in the proposal and would need to be further defined by the council at a later date, assuming the measure moves forward. The two other variables relate to the commission's discretionary authority to investigate complaints. One is the percent of complaints that the commission chooses to investigate, which we assume may range between 25 and 100% of all complaints submitted. And two is the potential for the overall number of complaints to increase. For the latter, we note that this can potentially occur immediately should the public perceive the commission to be more proactive compared to the current CRB or over time should police incidents rise in the future. We believe a 25% increase above the current 10-year historical average is conservatively reasonable. As shown in table four on page eight of our report, we estimate the number of complaints that may potentially be investigated to range between 31 and 153 complaints given these two variables. With this taken into consideration, we estimate that three FTE investigators would likely be required and up to 10 investigators could potentially be necessary. Aside from investigative staff, other personnel that we believe are likely to be required include an executive director to lead the commission's pro professional staff, a performance auditor to evaluate SDPD's compliance with federal, state, and local reporting laws and requirements, and support staff, including an executive assistant and an associate management analyst. In addition to this, we note that two other personnel could potentially be necessary. One is a specialized policy analyst to review and make recommendations on SDPD policies and procedures, and the other is an additional support staff and member that may be required depending on the number of complaints that the commission receives. With respect to non-personnel expenditures, the proposal would require that the commission receive independent outside legal counsel. For this, we estimate that a likely appropriate initial budget for legal expenses to be $100,000, and depending on the number of complaints and investigations, potentially up to $150,000. We, we estimate other NPE to range between $162,000 and $322,000, depending on the commission staffing level, 
We base this estimate on the Ethics Commission's FY20 NPE budget after excluding their outside council costs and adjusting for staffing level. We also assumed an additional $50,000 for other as needed professional or discretionary services that the new commission may require. These estimates, which in total ranges between $1.1 million and $2.3 million, are summarized in table six on page 11 of our report. Finally, the proposal included a provision that requires the mayor and city council to establish and fund a sufficient and appropriate budget for the commission. We note that this type of budgetary provision is not typically included in the city charter for the city's other independent offices, such as the Ethics Commission, and our office recommends for this provision to be excluded. With that summary of our report, I would just like to comment on the proponents' proposed modifications to the proposal as they relate to our recommendations. First, on the exclusion of informal and miscellaneous complaints, our recommendation for was, the, was for these types of complaints to be excluded from both the Commission's investigative and review capacities. The proposed modification only limits investigations and not required reviews. If a review of these complaints were to be required, it is likely that a more significant time commitment from the Commission's board members would be necessary. Lastly, our recommendation is to fully remove the budget provision from this proposed charter amend amendment. The proponent didn't get to it in her presentation, but um, she's proposing for a portion of this to still be maintained within the proposal. Uh, with our recommendation to fully remove this, our, our purpose is to maintain consistency with that of other independent offices. A future council ordinance, which would be expected to follow, is, is the more appropriate place for this provision. That concludes my comments, and I'm available for questions. Thank you very, very much for your thoroughness in the report. Um, it really, I think, gave a lot of us a lot of clarity about where we're headed. So now we're going to go to public comment, and uh, the first person to speak will be Ms. Maxwell. She has time seated by Julianne C. Um, so you're going to receive two minutes. You have one minute to speak on this item. So um, if you, the more time seated you have, um, the more time you'll take to speak. Um, following Ms. Maxwell will be Kate Yevendetti. Uh, there are two seats in the front for people who are speaking. So please, as I call your name, make your way up. Thanks. Francine Maxwell, first vice president of the NAACP San Diego branch. We stand in solidarity with Women Occupy and all the allies that you have the support letter of for this charter amendment. What is troubling is the massaging that has had to take place with this charter amendment. Women Occupy, Earl B. Gilliam Bar Association, and all the allies, we've set a lot of things aside. But the clincher for us right now is the youth piece. There is no reason for the youth to be wiped out of this when it comes to who needs to be seated on the commission. 18 to 24, you need their perspective on what they're feeling and what they're not, and how they're not being treated correctly. So when you're having your dialogue and your discussion, we have conceded Women Occupy has taken out of a lot of things, but the NAACP San Diego branch, we stand in solidarity with youth all over this county. And so we will not stand down and not allow them to have a seat at the table. They cannot be the future, because we know that they are the future, but they can't be the future if they do not stand with their elders so that they can learn and take notes. Seasoned seniors need to teach the youth things that have already been done. We are the trailblazers for them to walk through. So please look at, before you start taking things out of the Charter Amendment, that you do not discount our youth. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Yevendetti is next, time seated by Rita Pinkerton, and following will be Marisa Martin Talbert. Uh, good morning, council members. My name is Kate Yavendetti. I'm a member, as you know, of Women Occupy San Diego. I'm also a member of the National Lawyers Guild and the Tom Homan uh, Law Association and a, a resident of District 3. Um, uh, this proposed charter amendment, we are asking that you support this charter amendment with, that we have presented to you without any changes from this committee and that you move it forward. We know that you have received a lot of lobbying from the POA. There's no question about that. Everybody knows that. All you have to do is look at your records and hang out at city council a little bit. But um, we also know that council members 
are responsible to your constituents, not to outside lobbyists. The POA represents police department, 80% of whom do not reside in the city of San Diego, do not vote for council members on the city of San Diego. Your constituents are the ones who have voted for you. Your constituents are the people who want this charter amendment. Your um, vote today is not putting this into, uh, is not voting it into legislation. All your vote today is doing is allowing the people to vote on a charter amendment that they want. We are asking you to move this forward. Let the people vote. Let our voice be heard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Talbert. You have time seated by Eva Posner, and you will be followed by Esmeralda Flores. Good morning, Council. My name is Marissa Martin Talbert. I live in District 6, and I'm here as the co-chair representing San Diegans for Justice. This coalition is made up over 40 groups spanning from La Jolla to San Isidro and from Pacific Beach to College Area. And we've been working to bring forward the reforms presented here today. Council members, this has been a community effort. We have held hundreds of meetings, dozens of working groups, and we've gone, we've gone through several drafts. We have called experts across the country. We have researched the best practices, and we've worked to create a system that's unique to San Diego. We've met with the POA, we've listened to their concerns, and we've ch made changes to our proposal in response. Even we, we've also been respectful and flexible, and flexible, even when corruption has reared its ugly head, even when we've been misled about the process, even when we've been given conflicting legal advice, even when we've been denied the audi an audience with council office, the mayor, or the police chief, even as Kate said, POA's lobbyist runs these halls often. We don't have lobbyists, we have the community, we have hundreds of supporters and volunteers working to make San Diego a safer and more equitable place. We have thousands of misconduct complaints to motivate us. We have millions of dollars paid out in police misconduct lawsuits that have strengthened our conviction. We, don't, we, we now are looking and we stand before you with this proposal that we are extremely proud of and it is inclusive of all communities. It is transparent in its intention and fiscally responsible. So we, the community, ask you to put this proposal on the ballot, give us a voice in public safety, and give us the chance to protect and serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Flores, you're up next. You have time seated by Chelsea Burgess-Dotter. Uh, and following you will be Ms. Su Suzanne Morse. Thank you. Good morning, council members. My name is Esmeralda Flores, and I am here today on behalf of ACLU of San Diego and Imperial Counties. Our organization is supporting the ballot measure proposed by Women Occupy San Diego that seeks to create an independent community-led commission on police practices. We must continue the process of ensuring the public has the opportunity to vote on the most robust, fair, and balanced ballot measure. This ballot measure is an essential step to improving trust between the police department and our communities. The ability to conduct independent investigations with independent legal counsel and have the subpoena power necessary to review all relevant documents and witnesses is tantamount to providing a fair process and justice to victims of police misconduct. This measure also seeks to make the commission representative of the community by requiring representation from our, our youth, which we strongly support. We ask that this committee vote to send this ballot measure to city council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Morris, you are up next. You have time seated by Susie Dipmars, and uh, following you will be uh, Rodney Fowler. Hello. As I was speaking before about rape kits and sexual assault, I believe that this uh, Citizens Review Board and the investigative purposes fall into that. Uh, we have had sexual misconduct show up in, within the police department, as we know about the one who committed suicide not long ago. And so we need an independent commission to look into complaints, especially if there's one that's sexual assault and maybe they're not receiving justice or um, that it's against a police officer. Um, 
that that is where I'm coming from. Also, of course, the deaths that have been in police custody, uh, the instant shooting. I used to do dispatch for the North Las Vegas Police Department, and I know that there are procedures that you go through to de-escalate before you pull your gun. Unfortunately, in San Diego, when you hear that it happens within 60 seconds, 30 seconds, they're not, they're not applying those protocols. And you can use de-escalation. I have seen it in North Las Vegas police. So I am recommending that you push this forward to the council and let us voters decide if this is what we want. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fowler, you're up next. You will be followed by uh, Catherine Mendoza. Good morning. Committee Chair Montgomery, thank you. And committee members and staff, thank you. I'm Rodney Fowler. I'm president and chief steward of Local 127. And I rise today. Um, could you get a little bit closer to the mic? We've got some people in the back can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. So I rise in support of the uh, amendment with a couple of things. My first concern was about the uh, budget. I want to make sure that the council members have the, the purse strings to make sure there's not an unlimited budget on this, but I think that was addressed. The other part is I want to be transparent. I'm also in support of the police department. Uh, I have a 32-year-old son that's currently in the uh, academy right now, halfway through. Uh, shortly after Chief De David Nislight uh, got to be the chief, he met with the uh, Black Employees Association of the City of San Diego. I'm a 31 year and a half, almost 32 year city employee. And so Chief Nislight met, met with us at the Malcolm X Library, talked about recruitment from within the neighborhood, lifelong San Diego resident. My wife and I have three grown kids, and so I, the son is in the academy now, and so I look forward to that relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Catherine Mendoza, you're up uh, next. We'll be followed by Wendy Garlinter. Hi, my name is Catherine. Um, I want to share what uh, fighting for uh, justice against police violence means to me. I, as a youth, I was forced into sex work and, and residential facilities. I know firsthand uh, the corruption of uh, police intertwining. Also a survivor of police sexual assault in October of uh, 2006 in Los Angeles and uh, been a SART and DV domestic violence advocate for um, acting as an advocate when police do not believe victims. Um, and of course I conduct my own civilian oversight with filming police interactions in the Mid-City Division, uh, District 9, City Heights. Obviously, this is very personal to me, and I'm just thinking of in possibly uh, 2014 when the sexual assaults first erupted in uh, San Diego Police Department. This is important that it gets passed, and it also needs to span for police sexual assault and accountability. Um, they are not uh, heroes in any way victims. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, Wendy, you are up next, and Larry Stoll will be after you. Good morning. I'm Wendy Galerner, and I'm here representing the Pacific Beach Democratic Club, who proudly and unanimously supports the Women Occupy San Diego proposal for an independent, transparent, community-led commission on police practices. We support this measure because it will make San Diego a safer and more just city. We urge you not to move the city attorney's competing measure to the ballot because it does not ensure complete independence and will serve only to confuse the issues. Please take power, positive leadership and move forward with the Women Occupy San Diego proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Stoll, you are up next, followed by Doug Case. Thank you for considering placing this measure on the 2020 ballot. My name is Larry Stoll. I'm a 34-year resident of San Diego and a small business owner. Uh, I am here to support the Women who Occupy San Diego effort to place the Commission on uh, Police Practices measure on the ballot. Independent review of the police practices is a cornerstone of building community trust and public safety. 
I have grave concern that the current review board is unable to provide a truly independent review. I want to close with the memory of my friend, John Malodei, a 21-year-old refugee, <laughs> sorry, who spoke little English and was killed by the San Diego police in July of 2014 while barricaded in his house in City Heights. Please let San Diego residents vote on this important commission by moving it forward and placing it on the 2020 ballot. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Doug Case is up next. You'll be followed by Sarah Kent. Good morning. I'm Doug Case, member and immediate past chair of the CRB, although I'm speaking today as an individual resident of San Diego. As a certified practitioner of police oversight, I support the current proposal because it, because it is a hybrid that effectively blends the investigation, review, and audit models, utilizing the best of each in a way that enhances the work of the current CRB uh, in a very cost-effective way. It is important that the new commission have independent counsel, independently investigate officer-involved shootings and in-custody deaths, and operate independently of the police department and the mayor's office. In a letter to you, I expressed reservations about the open-ended investigatory authority in the original proposal. However, the revised language submitted today by the proponents adequately addresses those concerns. Finally, I support a dedicated use seats on the commission but believe that matters related to the composition of the commission are best addressed in the implementation ordinance rather than the charter amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sarah Kent is up next. Following will be uh, Mary Latibash Bili. That's the first time I've ever had to say Mary's last name. Okay. <laughs> Take it away, Sarah. Good morning, Chair Montgomery and committee members. My name is Sarah Kent, and I am the president of the San Diego Labor Democratic Club. The jobs of police officers are more dangerous when bad actors are not held accountable. We cannot change the culture without creating real accountability and building faith with the public. The current review board seems to exist only to give the community a fake sense of access to justice. That's a waste of public resources. Changing the culture through real accountability will reduce the violent events that trigger review, representing a savings of costs and lives lost. Representatives of the officers will have the right to negotiate and modify any final ballot language that could impact their jobs. There's no financial, legal, or moral reason to impede the progress of the proposal through this proper process. The proposed charter amendment is necessary, and I ask you to advance the ballot measure proposal. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Mary, I'm not saying your last name again, uh, will be followed by the NAACP representative. Thank you, council members. My name is Mary Latibashvili. Um, I am a resident um, of San Diego in District 3, and I am a Democratic activist. Um, I think it's really important that we move this proposal forward. Police officers are public servants, and they need to be held accountable to the public. And we can't do that. We can't increase accountability. We can't increase transparency. And we can't increase trust between community members and police officers without all of the parts of this proposal. We need to have a commission on police practices that has independent counsel, that has a subpoena power, and that has the investigatory power that this proposal has. I ask all of you to um, vote aye on this proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Honore, uh, you are up next, followed by Ann Barron. Good morning, committee members, committee chair. My name is Clovis Honore, president, NAACP San Diego branch. I don't need to discuss with you the details of the proposal. You all know what they are. The county sheriff's department shoved into a drawer 22 deaths under their watch. Who's going to oversight that? Are you going to fall into the same trap? Or are we going to look down the road years from now and say, you know, the city council could have done something to prevent the deaths of people being shoved into a drawer? But they didn't. NAACP is going to continue to watch, but we're not going to stand still and we're not gonna stand for it. This is important. This is not politics, these are lives. We expect you to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Barron, you are up next. You will be followed by Matt Valenti. Ann Barron, Peace Resource Center of San Diego. Uh, we expect that the committee will pass this on to council as written, um, as proposed. 
I want to read aloud a poem. Uh, Johnny Renee Nelson read this at a Peace Bazaar about two years ago. She gave me permission to read it again today. She calls it now a never-ending poem. The original title was How to Get Away with Murder. How to Get Away with Murder. Live in the USA. Wear a badge. Wear a uniform or wear plain clothes. Wear white skin. Make sure your targets are young, black, or brown males. Or make sure your targets are middle-aged or old, black and brown males. Choke, strangle, and suffocate your victims. Break their necks, break their spines. Shoot your targets repeatedly from a distance. Shoot your targets repeatedly from up close. Less shoot them in the chest, despair. shoot them in the back. There's more, and I'll post it on our website for you to read. Thank you very much. Right. Matt Valenti is next. You'll be followed by Martha Sullivan. Good morning, and thank you, committee chair and committee members. My name is Matt Valenti. I support this measure. To me, it's a common sense, kind of no-brainer. As an attorney myself, um, I look to the state bar as my independent oversight, and it makes me a better, more ethical, more competent attorney, knowing that if I violate my duty of loyalty to my client, there are consequences. My client can simply make a complaint to the state bar that has a lot of power to investigate and to make it right. And for a public servant, such as a police officer, I would want the same thing. I would know that it would make me a better police officer knowing that if the public has an issue with the way I am performing my duties, there is recourse. There is an independent commission that they can go to to get redress for their grievances. Every public official that serves the public needs this. Please support this measure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Martha Sullivan, you're up next. You'll be followed by Tasha Williamson. My name is Martha Sullivan. I'm proud to have been part of the Women Occupy San Diego Committee that started working on this issue in 2012. We've come a long way since then, seven, seven plus years. You've heard everybody talk about everything that's been done. I, I'm very, very proud of the work that's been done. And I wanna just say, women all over the world have led movements like this and despite the obstacles as they say nevertheless she persisted thank you miss sullivan uh, tasha williamson will be followed by tama becker verano thank you i support the people uh, and the people have spoken uh, and they've spoken, as you heard, since 2012. In the organizational structure of the city of San Diego, the people sit above the mayor and the city council. Uh, it is the people's uh, decisions that should be valued by the representatives that they put into the seats that you sit in today. Uh, it is with great pain uh, that I feel there are tactics that are being done and that are unjust uh, and trying to again gut and stop something that the people want, an independent commission on police practices. As you know, I have been a strong proponent um, of complaints against the police. I'm not anti-police, I'm anti-rogue officer. And I'm glad that there are people uh, who are good officers. One last sentence, Ms. Thank you. But I will say this, that if you continue to stop listening to the people, they will replace you. And I hope that they do that in 2020 as your next and first black woman mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tama becker Verano is up next. You'll be followed by Marjorie Larson. Good morning. My name is Tamma Becker Verano, and as a CPA, I work in an industry that performs independent audits of financial statements. 
This is done to assess financial stability, to identify any risks, to recommend improvements to, in internal, to internal controls and financial integrity. Outside investors rely on independent audits for assurances or going concerns to help them make informed choices on whether or not to invest their money. The audits enhance trust and confidence. So this is a multi-billion dollar industry designed to protect financial assets. It is incomprehensible that we would not dedicate the same logic, the same common sense, the same priorities to minimizing risks in our community and protecting human life. Just as in a financial audit, an independent commission should be created and designed to assess risk to determine if appropriate internal controls exist and are being followed within the police department to improve community relations, safety, and trust, and to ultimately protect the lives of our citizens and police officers. I have more, but please support this charter amendment. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Ms. Larson, you're up next. You'll be followed by Tariq Hadari. My name is Marjorie Larson. I'm a longtime member of Mission Hills, lived in the same house for over 50 years, and I'm over a 50-year member of the League of Women Voters. We must have a safer San Diego, and this ballot measure would do, will do so but by providing um, a independent investigations of police misconduct or complaints. It is free of political of considerations with independent staff and policies not bound to the council, mayor, city attorney, or San Diego Police Department. Please support this ballot measure. Thank you very much. Uh, Tariq, you are up next. You will be followed by Chair Lee. Good morning, community members. My name is Tariq Haidari. I'm the uh, policy advocate at Mid-City Can. Mid-City Can is a member of the uh, San, Diego's, San Diegans for Justice Coalition that's in support of this charter amendment. And uh, we support this charter amendment without language change, and we strongly urge you to preserve the youth seats on this in the charter. We believe youth have a voice in, uh, in the issues that impact them uh, on a daily basis, especially related to policing and uh, policies that overly or unnecessarily criminalize youth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chen Li is up next. You will be followed by Victor Ponce. Good morning, council members. My name is Trin Lay, and I'm the organizing director of Mid-City CAN. I urge this committee to move forward with the Women Occupy San Diego Charter Amendment regarding the establishment of an independent commission on police practices with two youth seats. A true oversight body should be independent of politics and have the authority to investigate major incidents and issues of complaints and misconduct, all of which the current CRB lacks. Um, an independent commission on police practices further strengthens ties between the police and communities they serve, especially communities of color. The Mid-City Can Youth Council have been organizing around this issue for months now because we believe that all youth should have the right to achieve their fullest potential, and we know that youth in our community are not having friendly interactions with police. If youth are being impacted by police practices, they should then they should also have a say on policing matters. We know that two youth seats on an independent commission will allow youth to give their personal perspective and insight. It is imperative that the two youth seats are written into the Charter Amendment because youth seats should not be at the whim of the new council in 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. P Victor Ponce is up next. You will be followed by Ariana Federico. Uh, hi, good morning, council members. My name is Victor Ponce. I'm here representing Mid-City Can and its youth council who couldn't be here today due to being in school. Um, statistics show that the youth uh, of color and low-income communities are more vulnerable to uh, police harassment and violence. Uh, so this is why our youth determined that the best way to go about this and having proper police oversight, as well as um, holding police accountable, is to have a create a new independent commission on police practices. That includes two youth seats so that their voices can be heard and that they uh, can have their expressions uh, heard as well, and we uh, ask that you send the charter and amendment to, as written by Women Occupy. Uh, thank you for your time. Hope you have. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ariana, Federico. You'll be followed by uh, Michael Brackney. Good morning, council members. My name is Ariana Federico, and I'm the new youth organizer at Mid City Can. I'm also a dis um, resident of District 4, and I do urge this committee to support regarding the establishment of independent commissions on police practices. So, Mid City Can's youth council does demand that the um, the committee move forward with the ballot measure that would create a truly independent commission led. Um, 
community-led commission on police practices with two youth seats. So our youth council is advocating for two appointed seats on this independent commission. Um, youth should be taken seriously as a segment of our community that can be a resource for enhancing community safety. Youth voices must be included in the decision-making process. Our youth are engaged and have continued to show up in these spaces to be part of the conversation of how our communities are policed. And we should want our young people to view the, polices, the police officers as individuals com committed to the role of protecting and serving the community. Each pledge card represents a youth, and we do have more that could not be here today because they are in school. So I hope that you all do support this, this um, amendment and do not change any of, of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Brackney is up next. You'll be followed by Evie Kosoar. Good morning, council members. My name is Michael Brackney. I'm representing the uh, Peace Resource Center of San Diego. And I'm speaking in favor of uh, the measure for an independent police uh, com commission on police practices, both for the sake of public trust in the police, I support everything that everyone has said so far about this, but also in support of police trust in the public. And to that issue, I want to add the simple uh, notion that this measure would help relieve police of the unfair burden of having to choose sometimes between supporting their own on whom they depend often for their own lives and their accountability to the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Evie Kosoar will be followed by Lori Thiel. Hello, uh, my name is Evie Kassauer. I am a member of Women Occupy San Diego and a resident of District 9 in San Diego. This is the first major step seeing that this meaningful change in the oversight on the police practices go forward. Those of you who were here when a similar attempt was made for the last election or read about it in the newspapers know that it was put aside in backdoor political maneuvers that reflected the poor leadership of the last council. Those who were around in 2016 remember that real reforms were pushed aside by two then council members to give the illusion of progress. Now it's the council's responsibility to give the community a reason to trust the processes by giving the public the transparency, independence, and accountability that they deserve. This commission will be a major step in creating trust between police oversight and the community, which will make San Diego safer, bring more equity to the criminal justice system. Please vote to send this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lori Thiel will be next, followed by Jean Wu Tran. Tran, excuse me. Good morning and thank you. I'm Lori Thiel, President, League of Women Voters of San Diego, and I urge you to move this amendment forward as written so that the voters can have a chance to vote on it. The League of Women Voters supports city government with structures and procedures that promote responsive, responsible, and efficient government with adequate checks and balances of power, with equal opportunities for citizens, and with provisions for citizen participants. We believe city government should facilitate accountability and citizen participation within its structures and procedures, providing for citizen input, which is representative of geographic areas, social composition, including youth. The League supports having a fully independent commission on police practices that has the power to investigate all in-custody deaths and officer-involved shootings, and to thoroughly conduct its responsibilities, it should have an independent attorney and subpoena power. We support policies and procedures that encourage community participation, provide police accountability via independent citizen oversight, and build public trust and positive community relationships. We endorse the objectives of this measure, proposed today and urge you to send it to City Council and let San Diegans vote on it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Sean Wee Tran will be followed by Youssef Miller. Hi, my name is Jean Wee. I'm a local activist as well, representing We the People of San Diego. So you already saw in the news this year there were a lot of push for more transparency and more um, 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 more transparency and improvement in the police, um, you know, the belief relationship with the public up and down the coast, um, the state, California, as well as probably national as well. So 
I'm keep thinking about this a lot because I think that the police cultures need to be changed, and in order for that change to be uh, efficient, effective, it need to have an independent commission and audit and review. And this is actually going to be beneficial for the department as well because it allows them to see from the perspective of the public toward the police, and so that way they can take all of that input back and say, okay, we can do better. This is how we're going to do better, right? So I urge your board to support this proposal without any changes as it is. And make sure to include a youth voice. Shout out to Miss City Ken. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Yusuf Miller is up next. You'll be followed by Loxie Gant. Good morning. My name is Yusuf Miller. I'm with the Racial Justice Coalition. The Racial Justice Coalition and its, uh, its, its program for ending the chokehold. And we support the women occupy ballot measure to, for independent investigation. The community expects investigation of officer related deaths to be investigated by truly independent non-law enforcement uh, personnel due to the appearance of bias towards law enforcement officers. Each of these voices one of the youth, of diversity, and not only diversity in ethnicity, but diversity in personnel who are not tied with the POA, whether it's, whether it's working with or related to officers in any manner. We need the community's voice in, and the community is the youth, the community is diversity, and the community is on both sides of the fence, POA and non-POA voices. So we're here to raise the voices of the families of Alfred Alongo, Rivera, McNeil, Vitali, Cornell, Wick, Daisy, and Mr. many Miller, more. One last sentence. Thank you. And many more who have lost their lives at the hands of law enforcement, whether city or county. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Lakti Gant is up next. You'll be followed by Amy Zamudio. I'm going to tell a story today that didn't make the news. I have a friend who's a homeowner in a multi-million dollar home in Mission Beach. When an SDPD officer stopped her and demanded her ID for an issue regarding her dog being off leash at around sunset, she turned to walk to get her purse and he tackled her from behind to the ground in front of her two-year-old daughter. When videos of this were sent to SDPD and we wanted to open an investigation, we had multiple videos, we had multiple witnesses. They said, you know what, this isn't really a formal complaint, you should do an informal complaint. This guy's a really nice guy, he has a family, he's great, this shouldn't actually be a complaint, don't worry about it, we don't have to move forward with it. We did some more research and found out he has personally shot two people of color. Why is it okay for this man to do what he did to her? And if she was of color, would she still be with us today? just because of the whiteness of her skin. Thanks. Thank you very much, Amy Zamudio. You're up next. You'll be followed by Aramik Glass-Blake. Um, yes, hi, I'm Amy Zamudio. And as we know, in La Jolla, we um, had the very un unfortunate in-custody death of Aaliyah Jenkins. And I do think that you had compassion um, when that happened. So I'm, I'm pretty certain you're going to vote in favor of this. However, um, after Aaliyah Jenkins in custody death, I was quite shocked how many people from La Jolla called me to tell me about abuses that they had incurred from law enforcement in our neighborhood area. And people didn't feel that they could report or say anything, and it's kind of segueing um, similar to, to Loxie's story of the woman in Mission Beach. So um, it affects our community a little bit. It's, we know this issue affects other communities on a, a much grander scale. Um, but again, I, I'm pretty sure, Barbara, you're gonna do the right thing and we appreciate you. Thank you very much, Aramik Glass-Blake. Uh, you'll be followed by Mark Letourneau. Hello, um, thank you Monica for all your hard work on this. Um, so I come from a family um, of police. We have a lot of, that will come to a shock to some folks. Um, and I 
wanted to say that because I think a lot of people think this is an anti-police situation, and this is not. This is what is right, what is just. I've been representing a young lady who had an investigation because she was slammed to the ground by a police officer, uh, picked up and then slammed again. And when the investigation took place, a retired officer did that investigation and presented to the city, and the city found that officer not guilty. She just won a case for $130,000 because the government knew that officer was wrong. We need this. We need the support of you to vote on this. And I'm encouraged and I'm confident that you will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mark Letourneau, you're up next. Uh, you'll be followed by Harold Lawson. And just a reminder, there are two seats up front reserved for speakers. So when I call, please make your way to the front. Thanks. Hi, my name is Mark Letourneau. I live in District 3, and I just wanted to present my strong support for an independent commission that will bring police transparency and accountability to San Diego. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lawson, you're up next, and our last speaker on this item will be Ismahan Abdullahi. Well, good morning, and thank you for your time. Um, I am, I was referred to this uh, action by SDOP, but I represent myself and the father of a couple young black people um, and hopefully some grandchildren at some point. Um, but I think the main thing that we're looking for here is we're looking for an independent autonomous body that can uh, make sure that the police mind their business and serve the public. Now, this doesn't just serve the public, it also serves the police department, in my opinion, because the police always ask for additional cooperation from the community. This is the vehicle. This is the way to do it. Build trust with the community by being more transparent, and uh, you get, uh, in return, you get the, uh, the cooperation you're looking for. One thing that uh, you talk about the is last that- Last sentence, sir. Hey, uh, about the youth, um, it, that's a no-brainer. I mean, we have young people who are representing this country and losing their lives. Uh, why wouldn't they be represented on this? So that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Ismail Abdullahi, you are our last speaker on this item. All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Ismahan Abdullahi. I'm the executive director of Mass Pace, Muslim American Society's Public Affairs and Civic Engagement. And I'm here to lift up this important cause. Um, imagine having a police oversight committee and reinforcing our, our deep commitment to police reform by having this independent oversight committee. It doesn't make sense, and let's be real, it doesn't make sense for police to police themselves. And if the commitment to protect and serve is just that, um, then an independent oversight committee shouldn't be a problem. Furthermore, if you think about what justice truly is, justice without transparency, without ac accountability, is not true justice. And I want to lift up Mid-City Can's um, um, point about including a youth voice in this committee. It's been my life's commitment to invest in the next generation of leaders and giving them an opportunity to learn, grow, and make an impact. Let them lead, put this ballot in the 20, on the top of the 2020, um, and see what happens. You'll be surprised. Follow community's heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have quite a few uh, speaker slips for people who are in favor but do not wish to speak. Uh, Sheila uh, Stittums, I, I, sorry, I can't read that. Um, Max Cotterell, Ramon Montano Marquez, uh, Stephanie Jennings, Wendy Weekhoff, Dan Shook Castillo, Layla Aziz, Laura Beza. So thank you so much everyone for uh, being here. This has really been a labor of love. Um, we heard from Ms. Sullivan that Women Occupy have been working on this since 2012. And now to see um, all of the organizations that have signed on and joined in this effort is, is uh, quite encouraging. I'd like to thank Andrea 
St. Julian, there you are, for working so tirelessly on this proposal. And I, I will say, yes, we, we do meet with a lot of stakeholders. We meet with a lot of community members. We meet with the POA, but I can say that you can say you have a lobbyist and that's not a bad thing because Andrea has been here and has been calling. Um, and so we've really had an equal amount of meetings with everyone because of her efforts. So thank you again. I want to thank all of the members of Women Occupy who were the, here from the very beginning, all the community organizations that have uh, signed on to this effort. Um, I also want to thank my staff for consistently communicating with community members nonstop. Uh, this is a, a charge that came out of my office and we have not deterred from that. Um, but also uh, keeping the Police Officers Association in loop, the independent budget analyst and the city attorney's office throughout this process. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just take chair's privilege and uh, go over a couple things before we go to committee comments. Um, this, as we know, this proposal has been in the works for some time. I remember being a staffer and meeting with Women Occupy about this very issue. And I can tell you that what's before us is a grave improvement from what we have seen in the past. Um, when Measure, Measure G passed, women Occupy representatives uh, called it a step in the right direction, but we all knew that more needed to be done at that time. And so I think it was last year or the year before last when a, a, a more robust amendment uh, was presented, it didn't even get through the procedural process at City Council. And I'll point that out for us to acknowledge as a collective of where we've come from and where we are now. Um, coming into this office, re reforming the Community Review Board on police practices was a top priority of mine. I have not strayed from my commitment to the community and to the entire city for police reform, for fair, just uh, police reform. Uh, my goal is to bring policies forward that are fair and that promote trust and transparency between community and police officers. This is why within 60 days of taking office, I tasked my staff to begin working with the city attorney's office and women occupied to ensure that whatever we brought before this committee and ultimately the council would reflect good policy and achieve our goals of establishing an independent commission with independent legal counsel, investigative power and subpoena power while complying with state and federal law. We have had hundreds of conversations, feels like thousands, but I'll just leave it in the hundreds for now, maybe 999. Um, a bunch of meetings and other correspondence that shows our dedication to this goal. My staff and I have exhibited transparency and have kept an open door in this process. We've kept everyone in the loop. We've not blocked anyone out. Uh, when we have not agreed, agreed, we have been upfront about the disagreement, disagreements and have tried to work through those issues. And although I was not aware of Madam City Attorney's proposal until it was filed, I'm grateful that she is willing to work with us. I, I believe her intent of wanting permanent independent legal counsel fits into the Women Occupy proposal and uh, re I'll reflect that language in the motion. Um, I just wanna touch on two things real quick. I think Mr. Honore brought up the, the, the 22 investigations that were not complete at CLRB. Some of the, uh, the, the language uh, that the IBA put forward, and they, fo they mentioned this in their uh, report as well, and something that we have been challenged with and that we are challenged with, is the ability for the commission not just to be there, but to be effective. And the reason why those 22 uh, cases were shoved into a drawer is because we have to comply with state law that says we have to finish an investigation within a year. That's state law, we don't control that. And so when we put forth these proposals it's, uh, or, or amendments, uh, it is based on the fact that we want this commission to be able to investigate fully the things that come forward. And in order to do that, we have to prioritize those complaints. We have to. And so that is the lens in which we're looking like at that because I don't want Mr. Honore or anyone else to come back to this council and say, we shoved not even one investigation in a drawer. So everything that we're doing is based on having full context for what it is the commission will be tasked with doing within a time limit that has not been set by the city council, but has been set by state law through the uh, police officers uh, bill of rights. So that, that's what some of these, uh, these modifications are about. With the UC, 
Anyone who knows me knows that I am a proponent of our young people, period. The only reason why, and, you, and I'm gonna go forward with some of these uh, things in a minute, that we feel, I feel, that it is best to put, implement the co composition of the board in the ordinance once this passes. The reason why is because if you look through the charter, and this is where this is going, we're talking about a charter amendment which currently the, the uh, Community Review Board on Police Practices has about one paragraph in there. And it is drawn out via ordinance, bylaws, and administrative regulations that are you know, a lot thicker. And that is where in the normal course of business at the city that the composition of any board is laid out. Any board, any commission, so that is the reason why I'm going to suggest what I'm going to suggest. It is in no way leaving a voice out, but if we think about the composition, we can have at least two seats for youth when we implement that ordinance. And if it, right now, someone said 18 to 24, right now we have 18 to 21. We don't want to have to come back to the charter every time if for some reason we cannot fill those seats. We want to be able to fluctuate. We can start with 18 to 21. That doesn't work. We can go up to 18 to 24 and we would be able to come to, back to council and do that and not go through a two year process while those seats are sitting there. We have a youth commission right now at the city that is inactive. We have to work on getting the, those seats filled as well. But we don't want to handcuff our young people, and we don't want to handcuff what we can do as a council by putting things in the charter that are, are so specific that we have to wait two rounds in order to get some activity from that. It, I, from, in my uh, opinion, as a policymaker, that is the reason why I'm going to propose this language, okay? I, you know, we're gonna say what we wanna say, but I do not wanna be misconstrued in that. I've always stuck up for the youth voice, always. I get flack in my office because I hire young people. I hire young people and people get mad because I hire young people and it takes a little bit more training and it takes a little bit more, but I do it. I put my money where my mouth is. That's what I do. So that this is, is not uh, in any way leaving a voice out. But I also want the commission possibly to have someone that has been impacted. That's going to be in the ordinance. You know, those implementation type things, once this passes, will be in the ordinance that we have to come back and as policymakers uh, make those decisions about composition. So, so with that, th that is why um, I'm going to... Uh, focus on these things with the, with the focus on the four big items which are establishing an independent commission independent council investigative powers and subpoena power um, I would like to send this proposed uh, this proposal to uh, the city attorney for additional legal review and analysis and to to draft legally uh, appropriate language working with the committee consultant for the ballot measure to be presented at the next PSNL and committee meeting uh, with the following changes uh, in section 41.2, uh, add the following two clauses, and they're listed there, but I'll read them. For as long as the commission remains um, established, the executive director of the commission shall be appointed by the council and shall thereafter serve at the direction and the pleasure of the commission. Also, second paragraph, the council shall establish and uh, establish rules and regulations as may be necessary for the commission to carry out its function. Such rules and regulations shall not conflict with federal, state, and, and local laws. Uh, second, revise the language in, in section 41.2, subsection 2F, from quarterly reports to semi-annual reports. In section 41.2, uh, subsection 3A, which reads the authority to investigate all complaints against officers of the San Diego Police Department add the following language that the commission does not have a duty pursuant to section 41.2, subsection 2A. This was also in the, in the report uh, presented by uh, Ms. St. Julian. Remove section 41.2, um, 
uh, subsection 3A4 and, and add an incident in which data shows a pattern of misconduct by officers involved and subsection 3A5 an incident in which data shows a pattern of inappropriate policies, procedures, or, or practices of the San Diego Police Department or its members. That was also in the presentation, um, but these are all changes to the original proposal that is in our, our documents. Um, uh, strike the language in uh, section 41.2, subsection 5, that talks about independent legal counsel and replace it with the following language. The Commission on Police Practices shall retain its own legal in counsel independent of the city attorney for legal support and guidance in carrying out its responsibilities and duties. Uh, remove language in section 41.2, subsection 6 in its entirety. Uh, remove language in subsection 8 regarded mandatory timeline, um, remove language regarding use seats on the commission between the ages of 18 to 21, I explained that, and please conduct the following legal analysis, uh, provide clarification on the commission's mandatory duties versus overall duties, provide clarification to address the IBA's recommendation regarding funding and investigations of informal and miscellaneous, compl miscellaneous complaints, Provide uh, clarification and establish parameters for items outside of mandatory investigative duties. Provide clarification and or advice as to the placement of the charter amendment as it is currently written. Provide legal analysis on language in the proposal and whether it is consistent with the charter overall. Provide legal analysis on amended language in this motion. Provide an analysis on legal effect of any additional powers or duties clause written in the ballot uh, measure proposal, some of that we've already taken care of. But nothing in this motion precludes uh, the city attorney's office from changing this, the section, subsection, or non-material language specified above. The intent of including the language in the motion, however, is to capture the goals of Women Occupy San Diego community organizations and stakeholders within the draft ballot measure that the city attorney must write pursuant to council policy 000-21. And with that, um, I'll move this item. And I'll go to council member comments. Council member Moreno. Uh, thank oh, you. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, council member, just no. the city attorney would like to make a comment. Just real quickly, I wanna clarify that this was your motion and it was based off the proposal that was part of the um, committee, um, what was uploaded for the committee comment and not necessarily what was put in the presentation. So we make sure that, I just wanna make sure that when you're saying revising language in section 4.41.2, you're talking about what was uploaded and presented to committee and it's those changes. Is that, that correct? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Yes. Councilmember Moreno. Thank you for the presentation and uh, thank you to all the speakers here today. Um, first and foremost, I wanna thank Chair Montgomery for your leadership on this. Um, in addition, I also want to thank Women Occupy San Diego uh, for all their work, uh, as well as all the community organizations and stakeholders who were a part of this very long process. Um, I'm glad to see this ballot proposal come forward. Um, I think by proactively communicating and working together, we can build and maintain strong levels of trust and respect between our communities and the San Diego Police Department. And with that, I'm happy to second your motion. Thank you. Vice Chair Bree. Um, I'd also like to thank you, Chair Montgomery, for your leadership on this important issue. And I'd like to thank Andrea St. Julian and uh, Women Occupy. I admire your tenacity of the hundreds of hours of outreach, the, your willingness to meet with all sorts of groups who have different opinions on this. It's very important. Um, we all know that public safety is the number one responsibility of local government. Um, I value and respect the work that our police officers do every day. It's a very hard job. And I admire Rodney Fowler's son for joining our police department. It's important that our police department reflect the diversity of our community. Um, I am honored to support this measure today. I don't view it as an anti-police measure. I view it as a pro-community measure in building more trust between our residents and our police officers. Thank you again for your hard work on this. Thank you very much, Councilmember Kate. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation and also to the IBA's office for their work on, on this at my request from the Rules Committee. I do have some questions and I, I apologize, Madam Chair. I, I, don't, I didn't get a copy. I think um, Ms. Angelian referenced a red, red line version. I don't have that in the backup, so I don't know we, which. Uh, I have a copy of the motion, uh, but okay. I don't have a copy of a red line version. Okay. Uh, or I want to make sure which version I'm working off of, that's all, because I'm working off of what was uploaded from her, but there are some things that were not referenced. That is so. correct. So okay. we're working from what was uploaded, okay. uh, which came straight over from the Rules Committee, Perfect. and okay. the motion is uh, is reflecting that. that. Okay. just want to make sure I'm on the right, on the right page. On the one thing that was brought up in the IBA's uh, presentation and the report, and there still is uh, somewhat of a difference between what was uh, presented by the proponents and outlined here today is in the terms of the category one and two uh, investigations for and reviews. I think the IBA mentioned that their recommendation was to limit the complaint and reviews only to category one and two. I just want to confirm that um, based off what was presented by the proponents and I think in, in your amendments, Madam Chairs, it would only relate to the investigation portion, not on the reviews. So the reviews could still be done on um, informal and miscellaneous complaints. Is that your motion, Madam Chair? So, so as of right now, um, that is the motion, but there is a, a a bullet to the city attorney to provide legal analysis on that because we have just heard that from the IBA uh, this morning with regard to that language, but um, hearing from the city attorney uh, would be good. And then when we come back to PS and LN with the legal analysis and the draft language, we can address it at that time. Okay, so you're gonna be reviewing whether the, we have the ability to, so can, can you talk about what, I guess what your review would, would entail? Well, as, as presented, the motion does state that they want to have us review and provide clarification to address IBA's recommendations. Okay. So we, can, we will do that as best we can as a legal review. Okay. And then in that, there, I know there are other sections. Sorry, I went through all my paperwork here. There are other sections um, throughout this, that throughout the proposal that talks about, I think I brought this up at Rules Committee, uh, for example, 41.2, I guess it's going to be 41.22G about any additional duties established by ordinance and consistent with duties established in this section. Um, part of your review to make sure that there would be the potential for no conflict between the ordinance, implementing ordinance and the charter in terms of the powers and duties that would be established by the by this language for the, the committee, so there's no conflicts in what they can do, or what they're limited to do versus what is adopted in the implementing ordinance. I just want, I'm talking, trying to figure out from the, an open-endedness of this, you know, if, if we're limited to the charter, does the ordinance gonna be able to supersede that and how that, that works? So they're gonna be vehicles to maneuver in that. I don't know if I'm making sense or not, so I apologize. <laughs> um. <laughs> I don't. I, again, I, I, I don't. don't I want to. I don't want to misstate the motion, but how the beginning part of the motion says that for the city attorney to review and um, analyze the draft, uh, the draft language to make sure it's legally appropriate. Some of that review will be making sure that um, the charter is um, that the charter section amendments work within our whole charter altogether. So there will be review to make sure that the the end language is um, legally appropriate, and, or we will spot issues. Okay, um, what I'm gonna do that, I'm just gonna, I guess, put some stuff on the record and just, because it, it, this is the tends to come back to this committee then with. Okay. Yes, and we are um, shooting for next month. Okay. Because we have other requirements that we wanna make sure that we meet yeah. and so that the city council can vote appropriately for it to okay. make it to November. Um, so one of the questions I had um, is regards to, and this is gonna be from a, De definition standpoint in defining it and ensuring that not only the committee knows what their role is, but also from, from my standpoint as a policymaker, as well as the public in terms of their role on this. So for example, um, 41.23A3, it talks about discretionary authority. Um, 
it talks about an incident that has generated substantial public interest or concern. Again, just trying to figure out definitions for what these all these things mean. Um, I've talked about 41.2 2G, which is the additional duties established by ordinance. Um, and there's um, 41.23, I think it's I, any additional powers established by ordinance and consistent with powers established in this section. Just making sure we're all gonna be consistent in what we're all, we're all looking at. So more than anything else, it's ensuring that there are no um, open-endedness, and that's what I'm gonna be looking at when this comes back. Um, and making sure that, again, there are clear definitions in, in line with what the IBA essentially outlined is that we want, I want to limit this um, even at a high end of $2 million. That's still a lot of money. Um, I remember when we originally heard this, I think the cost was projected to be $800,000. We're now at over $2.3 million. And when we're say, looking at a $64 million budget deficit next year, we want to make sure that we're not going to be in a position where, again, we can't uh, fund certain things you want to do. So um, for the purposes of today, I will vote yes to move this forward, but I'm going to leave the caveat that coming back, um, if some of these things aren't cleared up, then I'm going to um, raise those issues. So for today, though, I appreciate the work by the chair in trying to define this. It is a lot better than it was um, four years ago um, from the language standpoints and trying to define things and clarify that. I don't think it's there yet, so I'm qualifying my yes vote today with that, and I will be voting um, to move this forward, but if it's not addressed in some of these things, I, I'm gonna raise those issues, so. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, just real quick, um, I wanna bring Ms. St. Julian up to just address some of the cost, um, because that was at the latter part of her presentation, I think, but also just, uh, there's, an, um, there's also a clause of, within the motion of providing analysis on the legal effect of additional powers or duties or these clauses that are written in the on the ballot measure so we're definitely asking the city attorney to look at the legal legal effect of those yeah um to just briefly address the budget issue uh, i want to make sure that we understand that even in the iba's proposal or estimated budget they estimated that the most likely cost was 1.1 million dollars so they did give a range because of you know the uh, certain circumstances, but um, the most likely cost is around 1.1 million dollars. That is very much in the pocket uh, and very similar to what other boards and commissions spend, and also what we spend here in San Diego. So, for example, San Jose, which has a police department half our size, uses uh, has a budget of 1.4 million dollars. Um, CLURB, which is the San Diego County counterpart, they have a budget of just over $1 million. If you look at the Ethics Commission here in San Diego, uh, which is uh, you know an independent commission similar to what this commission would be, they have a budget of $1.7 million. So $1.1 million is very much in the pocket of what is generally spent and what we as San Diegans think is appropriate on, on spending on, on similar, similar boards and commissions. And one other thing I, I, I want to point out uh, is that we spend, we pay out $4.4 million a year on litigation arising from complaints against police. $4.4 million a year. We spend that, and I don't know if we've ever had a, an investigation as to why we're spending $4.4 million on police, uh, on police allegations of police misconduct. So I want to point out, you know, okay, wait a second. If we're into scrutinizing costs, let's scrutinize how much we spend paying off for allegations of misconduct by the police, $4.4 million. In 2010 to 2011, we paid out over $11 million on police misconduct. So if we want to talk about costs, let's talk about those costs, okay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering that question. So at this time, I'm gonna uh, call for a vote unless anyone else has any comments. Okay. Um, we have a motion by myself and a second by Councilmember Moreno. All those in favor? Any opposed? 
So that passes unanimously. Uh, thank you so much. My young people in the front, I'm not gonna forget about you, okay? Item number three, uh, we're going to be a consideration of ballot measure. Um, um, we're we're gonna um, call for a five minute recess um, and then we're gonna hear from Madam City Attorney. <laughs> 